You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hey, y'all. Spooky season is here. And if you're looking for a show to whet your appetite for a little haunted history, then I'd like to invite you to check out Southern Gothic, a chart-topping history podcast that explores some of the most infamous legends, folklore, ghost stories, and hauntings of the American South. We've covered all sorts of stuff from the Bell Witch of Tennessee to the disappearance of the Confederate submarine, the H.L. Hunley, not to mention our deep dives into the local lore of some of America's oldest and most haunted cities like New Orleans, Charleston, and St. Augustine. So if you're ready for a little good old-fashioned Halloween storytelling with a commitment to quality historical research, then be sure to check out Southern Gothic today. It's available now on all your favorite podcast apps. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 168 of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And those crickets chirping this week where Tracy usually chimes in uh, are because Tracy is more than a bit under the weather this weekend. It took her longer than it usually does at the beginning of a new school year to get sick, but whatever the kids are passing around now, she caught this past week, so you guys are stuck with me for this show. Sorry, I'm sure you aren't any happier about that than I am, but hopefully she'll be back for the next episode, and we'll make this show short and sweet since I'm flying solo. All right, so previously on the podcast, we looked at the action at the last battle of the Seven Days Campaign, the Battle of Malvern Hill. And we'd said that Malvern Hill was one of the most misunderstood battles of the Civil War. And we said that since there seems to be the notion that Robert E. Lee simply decided to line up his army and sent the poor Confederate infantry charging uphill over half a mile of open ground into the teeth of a vast host of Federal artillery, which was arrayed wheel to wheel on Malvern Hill. But we wanted to spend quite a bit of time showing that what happened at Malvern Hill wasn't quite that clear cut. We wanted to show that it was really a confusion of circumstances on the Confederate side that led to the disaster at Malvern Hill. And it really was a bloody disaster. As we said last time, it was clear to everyone that the Confederates had been given a good kicking on July 1st. Not surprisingly, therefore, from almost the moment the disastrous battle ended, interested parties began placing blame for the defeat. Uh, D.H. Hill, for instance, notes that all the rebel units were fed into the fight piecemeal, rather than in a concentrated assault, which was correct. But Hill also claimed that Magruder hardly did any fighting at all on his side of the field, which was enormously incorrect. Uh, Magruder, after all, had the casualties to prove it, and his men had gotten closer to the Union lines near the crew house than did any other Confederates. Well, actually, every Confederate general has been subject to criticism and blame for his role at Malvern Hill. Uh, Stonewall Jackson was blamed for not sending his troops into the fight, but in reality, he did send in D.H. Hill's division, and he was bringing up more of his divisions when darkness put an end to the battle. The attack simply came too late in the day for Stonewall to get all of his men into the fight. And then Uge, for reasons we didn't get into, uh, was unhappy on July 1st and therefore slow to cooperate with Magruder, 
But in the end, three of his four brigades brought their full weight into the fight. And Clifford Doughty, in his book on the Seven Days, places a lot of the blame on Longstreet for overly influencing Lee that two grand batteries of rebel artillery could smash the Union line. But Lee saw the ground, and he believed that the idea could work. And finally, Magruder, again, has been blamed for marching his troops off in the wrong direction, and so delaying his arrival on the battlefield for several hours, and then launching ill-advised assaults when he did show up. But there's no reason to believe that attacking the strong Union line at Malvern Hill several hours earlier would have changed the result of the battle. And when he did finally arrive on the field, Magruder simply obeyed his orders to attack the Yankees. One order from Lee through Chilton, and one order directly from Lee by way of Captain Dickinson. Magruder, not wanting to be rebuked by Lee for lack of aggression, as he had been on June 29th, here at Malvern Hill promptly obeyed Lee's orders. And thus, when Robert E. Lee rode up to Prince John's headquarters that night, and asked, General Magruder, why did you attack? Magruder could respond, In obedience to your orders, twice repeated. For Magruder's part, it was simply a confusion of circumstances that led to an attack that Robert E. Lee hadn't wanted. But as with the other battles of the Seven Days Campaign, the final responsibility for the Malvern Hill disaster rests with Robert E. Lee. Lee allowed Chilton to send out an untimed, poorly worded order that set the advance of a single brigade, Armistead's, as the signal for the Army's attack to begin. But Armistead was never even made aware of this, and Lee never placed himself in an advantageous location so that he, as Army commander, could take responsibility for launching the assault. In fact, when Lee decided the artillery barrage wasn't going to work, he rode away from the front, first to the Confederate left, and then behind the main lines, all without canceling the earlier attack order. When word arrived from both Whiting and Magruder in the late afternoon that the Federals were retreating and that Armistead had advanced, Lee didn't ride to the front to observe for himself and confirm the events but instead he immediately ordered Magruder to attack. And when Lee did then go forward, and he saw that it was a more difficult task than he'd believed, he didn't order the attacks to cease, but instead he sent in McClaw's division and instructed Magruder to shift his attack further to the right. And these were all Lee's decisions, and the ultimate outcome resulted from his actions, that is, orders given, and his inactions, that is, not canceling orders and not going to the front to confirm events. Now, there's no doubt that Robert E. Lee was fatigued and frustrated and not feeling well on July 1st. As you guys will recall, he asked Longstreet to accompany him that day in case Old Pete would have to take over direction of the battle. Lee even took a nap at a key moment that afternoon, with none other than Jefferson Davis standing watch over him. And so Lee obviously wasn't at his physical or mental best on July 1st, and the decisions he made reflect that. The events of that day, much like the events of the entire week, didn't turn out the way Robert E. Lee had wanted them to go. But on July 1st, as on June 26th, 27th, 29th, and 30th, most of the blame for the disappointing outcome belongs to Lee himself and his not-yet-fully-formed command style. And perhaps more frustrating to Lee than anything else was the fact that deep down, he probably knew this to be true. As we said last time, the Confederate defeat at Malvern Hill was so complete that many rebel commanders were convinced McClellan would take advantage of his victory and launch a counterattack the next day, 
and many Union commanders, including Little Mac's loyal friend, Fitzjohn Porter, tried to persuade McClellan that they should launch a strong attack from Malvern Hill on July 2nd. But Little Mac refused to consider it. He ordered the Army of the Potomac's retreat to continue, eight miles down the James River, to Harrison's Landing. McClellan refused to see the defensive victory at Malvern Hill as the potential starting point of a decisive counteroffensive, and he instead saw it as merely a temporary check of the hordes of Confederate troops that he claimed were pursuing him. We've said that from the moment Lee launched his attack north of the Chickahominy on June 26th, George McClellan lost his will to fight. He simply allowed Robert E. Lee to seize the initiative, and Lee then pressed the tactical offensive in a week of furious fighting in what came to be known as the Seven Days Battles. McClellan argued that the Confederates outnumbered his army. He assumed that even after the week's casualties, the rebels still numbered near 180,000 men and had plenty of fresh troops. After all, how could Lee continue to attack on five out of six days unless he had a much larger force than the Army of the Potomac? Well, that anyway seems to have been Little Mac's reasoning, and in his mind, retreating was the only way to save his army from the overwhelming host of the enemy. Unable to imagine much beyond his own cautious approach to warfare, George McClellan simply failed to grasp that it was not overwhelming numbers, but rather Robert E. Lee's audacity and aggressiveness, which were the driving force behind the relentless rebel attacks. But while one may attempt to explain McClellan's decision to retreat to the James by pointing out his delusional belief in vast Confederate hordes, it's much harder to explain Little Max choosing to absent himself from the main fighting at each of the campaign's battles. As one Union soldier bitterly noted, Curiously enough, there was almost always something for McClellan to do more important than to fight his own battles. And we've already pointed out that it was at Glendale that Little Mac's behavior in this regard is most inexplicable and most inexcusable. But really, throughout the entire week, despite his self-serving talk of sharing dangers with his brave soldiers, McClellan actually distanced himself physically and psychologically from his army. He removed himself from active field command and left it to his corps commanders to manage the retreat and try to fend off the enemy. And by the time of the withdrawal from Malvern Hill, the fiery Phil Kearney was ready to ascribe McClellan's behavior to either cowardice or treason. And it's tempting to agree with Kearney, but by absenting himself from the fighting, we don't think Little Mac was committing treason, nor do we think it was due to personal cowardice. Instead, we think the answer lies in McClellan's fear of ruining his own idealized reputation. Remember, we've talked before about George McClellan's belief that God had given him, George Brinton McClellan, the task of not simply commanding the Army of the Potomac, but of saving the Union. And we think that to preserve his reputation and therefore safeguard his role as the only man who could save the nation, McClellan consciously chose to absent himself from these battlefields so that in the event his army suffered a defeat, he could dodge the blame. He could point to the fact he wasn't there and disassociate himself from any defeat the army suffered. McClellan seems to have believed that by simply not being there, his reputation wouldn't be tarnished by the failure if the army was defeated. And if his reputation remained intact, he could still be the savior of the Union. And now, although such thinking seems ridiculous and monumentally self-serving to us, uh, 
it might not have been illogical. Little Mac's reputation suffered among those officers and men in the army who believed that he'd retreated unnecessarily after Malvern Hill and that he'd fumbled a brilliant opportunity to counterattack the rebels. But far more numerous were soldiers whose disappointment at the setbacks during the seven days failed to undermine their confidence in McClellan. And we could cite numerous examples from officers and soldiers, letters and journals illustrating this point, that these men still retained the utmost confidence in Little Mac. And many of these soldiers believed the government in Washington was to blame, that the government had failed to provide their George with the men and material necessary for victory. And these soldiers who knew nothing of McClellan's delusions and fears believed that the army that they had fought well against a superior foe and only needed reinforcements to go after the rebels again. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produce the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time. And the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation, Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics. We go back to source materials in their original languages. And we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. President Lincoln left Washington on July 7th and traveled to Harrison's Landing to examine the Army of the Potomac for himself. And during the trip, Lincoln met with McClellan and received from him a lengthy and unsolicited letter detailing to the president how to proceed with the war. And Little Mac not only spelled out his views on military matters in this letter, but also his views on political policy. Really, it was a measure of McClellan's hubris that even in the wake of his utter failure before Richmond, he still had the gall to lecture Lincoln on strategy and policy. In this letter, McClellan argued for a limited or soft war aimed at conciliation, and he strongly opposed the policies of confiscation of Southern property or emancipation of Southern slaves. Well, Lincoln read the letter in McClellan's presence, and then he pocketed it without comment. Well, Lincoln's response, or non-response, to his letter frustrated McClellan, who had hoped for a positive reaction. Little Mac complained to his wife that Lincoln was incapable of rising to meet the challenges of the times. 
the president, meanwhile, was thinking the exact same thing about the general. The times had changed, and McClellan's failure on the peninsula had helped change them. While Lincoln was at Harrison's Landing, Congress was putting the finishing touches on a more stringent confiscation act. While Lincoln had already begun contemplating limited emancipation as a military measure. In a carriage ride in mid-July, he told Secretary of the Navy Wells and Secretary of State Seward that he, quote, had about come to the conclusion that it was a military necessity, absolutely essential for the salvation of the Union, that we must free the slaves or be ourselves subdued. And on July 22nd, the president uh, acquainted his cabinet with the Emancipation Proclamation he had begun drafting. He told them he wasn't asking for their approval, uh, that he had already made up his mind. Meanwhile, back at Harrison's Landing, McClellan was pondering what to do next, and whether he had the manpower he believed he needed to do it. That's when a new layer was added to his frustrations with official Washington. You see, on July 11th, just after returning from his visit to the Army, Lincoln called Major General Henry Halleck from his command in the West to Washington to become the new General-in-Chief. You guys will recall that this position of General-in-Chief had been vacant since the President had stripped it from McClellan back in March. Well, now Little Mac wasn't pleased with Halleck's appointment. He called Halleck's promotion, quote, a slap in the face, and told his wife, it is grating to have to serve under the orders of a man I know by experience to be my inferior. Well, McClellan could have actually used those exact same words to sum up his opinion of Lincoln and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. That's because despite the collapse of his campaign before Richmond, McClellan still admitted no mistakes and always insisted on blaming others, particularly his superiors in the War Department and the Lincoln administration, still insisted on blaming them for his failures. Well, at any rate, when Halleck arrived in Washington in late July, Lincoln sent him to Harrison's Landing to assess the situation there for himself and to learn McClellan's intentions. The president, for his part, had already decided that McClellan was a timid, irresolute, and overcautious field commander, but rather than take the responsibility of relieving Little Mac himself, Lincoln told Halleck that he could keep Little Mac in command or not, as he pleased. But McClellan had been talking fight ever since arriving at Harrison's Landing. He talked of renewing the offensive and taking Richmond, if he was adequately reinforced. But he didn't seem to have in mind any particular plan, and he felt he needed still more men. This was the situation when Halleck arrived at Harrison's Landing on July 24th and asked about a resumption of the advance on Richmond. McClellan told him up front that any offensive would require 50,000 more troops. But when pressed for a specific plan of attack, Little Mac proposed crossing the James and marching on Petersburg, the southern doorstep to Richmond. But when Halleck was lukewarm to that movement, McClellan then proposed an advance up the north bank of the James to Richmond, but he would still need 30,000 reinforcements for that. Uh, He would, of course, be far more comfortable, he said, with the aforementioned 50,000, though. Well, Halleck told McClellan that 50,000 reinforcements were out of the question, and that he wasn't authorized to promise more than 20,000. So he gave Little Mac a choice. March on Richmond, up the north bank of the James, with those 20,000 reinforcements, which would bring his full strength to 110,000 men, or Little Mac could simply give it up and withdraw from the peninsula. Well, McClellan slept on it, and the next day he reluctantly agreed to try the plan with the additional 20,000 troops. 
After Halleck returned to Washington, though, Little Mac wired him, again jacking up his minimum need for reinforcements to renew the offensive to 35,000. And that settled things for Halleck. On August 3rd, he wired McClellan an order that stated, quote, It is determined to withdraw your army from the peninsula. And that means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is Abraham Lincoln and the Second American Revolution by James McPherson. In this book, which is really a series of essays by McPherson, uh, he examines Lincoln's role in making the Civil War into arguably the single most transforming and defining experience in American history. Uh, don't forget you can find all of our book recommendations at the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. Uh, so next up on the podcast timeline is the Battle of Second Manassas, which took place at the end of August 1862, and we'll be working our way toward that next major clash here with the regular episodes of the podcast. But we're also going to be using upcoming members episodes to look beyond Virginia at some of the other things that were happening in the summer of 1862. We actually started this last week with the release of members episode number 41, which we used to look at what happened to the USS Mound City out on the White River in Arkansas in June 1862. And then some other topics we'll be covering are the Battle of Secessionville outside Charleston, South Carolina, the Battle of the Rams on the Mississippi River at Memphis, the saga of the CSS Arkansas during the summer of 1862, and then we'll also look at the Sioux Uprising in Minnesota. So lots of good stuff coming up in the future for the members of the Strawfoot Brigade. And a quick thank you to the two newest members of the Strawfoot Brigade, Brent and Matthew. Okay, so that's about it for now. And I'm sure you guys hope, as I do, that Tracy will be back with us next week. Uh, she's been resting and convalescing this weekend with liberal doses of cough syrup and Downton Abbey. Hey! <laughs> well, okay, that's true. Yes. Anyway, thanks for hanging in there and listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Tracy and I do hope you'll join us again next time as we begin our march towards Second Manassas. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.